This episode is sponsored by our brand new book, The Snake and Mine Nicotine. I've co-written this book with author of Alcohol Explained, William Porter, and I combined our trusted approaches for controlling alcohol and bringing the same science-backed, grace-led methods for all those who are ready to change their relationship with nicotine, vaping, smoking, chewing, whatever it is. We uncovered the subconscious beliefs about smoking and vaping that keep us stuck in the same cycle. We ask thought-provoking questions and share exercises that spark clarity in your journey to kick the habit without willpower without pain, without feeling like you're missing out in an easier way that maybe you ever thought it was possible. So if you're ready to start healing your mind and body from the effects of smoking, you can pre-order your copy today at thisnakedmindnicotine.com. Hi, this is Annie Grace and welcome to this Naked Mind podcast. So I have the coolest episode in a while today. Well, they're all cool, but this one is super cool. So, uh, wow. First of all, I'm here with William Porter and Scott Pinyard. Scott is head coach at This Naked Mind, and William is the author of a bunch of amazing books, including Alcohol Explained. And they've both been on the podcast before. In fact, the podcast was how Scott and I met. And then William, you and I were on the podcast forever ago when I read Alcohol Explained. I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many parts of this that like complemented this naked mind. And I've heard from thousands of people that they often buy both books together and it's kind of the one-two punch for alcohol. So um, here we are. Hi guys. Hi, Hi. as proof, I bought both books together. That's awesome. <laughs> so which one was better? Just kidding. <laughs> I have no opinion. <laughs> You're neutral. You're neutral. <laughs> totally awesome. neutral. <laughs> so fun. So we have a really big, really cool announcement. And I'm, I'm so excited about this since kind of really the beginning of time when I was time with this naked mind, when I was thinking about this naked mind, and I knew that it had helped me so much with alcohol, but then I was really realizing that the principles apply to pretty much any habit that you're stuck in because the principles of science-based compassion led knowledge before actually making a change are so incredibly powerful. And I actually named it this naked mind, because I imagined that some point in the distant future, the, this naked mind would be applied to all sorts of other habits beyond, beyond alcohol. And so the day is here and we are announcing William and I have partnered to co-author this naked mind for nicotine, which has just been so much fun. So for me, I actually want to have this conversation and Scott is here because Scott is actually um, case study number one (laughs) (laughs) who has used this Naked Mind principles to stop vaping, which was just the coolest thing. So why don't we actually start there and then we can get into uh, both of you have a story. So I'd love to hear both of your stories, but Scott, let's, let's start with you. And then we can talk about the specifics of, of the book, which is coming, coming out in I think it's September of 2022. So right around the corner, but it is available for pre-order now. So there's a link in the show notes, which yeah, we're so excited about. It's so fun to actually go beyond alcohol into, into other habits. And hopefully this will be just the beginning. So, yeah, I mean, I'll just dive right in to, to what happened with me. Um, I uh, had a, an interesting journey in that I started smoking cigars. I actually worked in the cigar shop uh, when I was 18 and I loved it. I loved everything about it, like the accoutrement of it and all the, um, yeah, just all the fanciness that kind of came with it. And toward the end of college, uh, started, I would like once in a while, like bomb a cigarette. For me, those two things, smoking and drinking kind of went hand in hand. Um, and then, you know, I, I was stuck. I found myself being stuck on that, but that was okay for me at the time. A lot of my friends smoked, whatever. Um, and then I eventually quit. Um, I spent, I had so many stops and starts. And I think it's that Mark Twain, uh, quote, like I've quit thousands, I've quit smoking thousands of times. I do it every night. Right. Uh, but like, I eventually was able to get beyond it, but I really uh, kidded myself about the addictive nature of nicotine. So what would happen is I'd go a period of time and then I'd have a cigar again and then I'd find myself right back on it. And then I would go a period of time and have a cigar again. And then along came this thing called vaping. And my God, it doesn't smell. I could do it anywhere. And it didn't feel, or at least I sort of told myself or convinced myself um, that it wasn't as serious. 
Um, so I went from like the occasional once in a while cigar to a lot of vaping all of the time. Um, and it was a real, uh, at first I didn't feel super bad about it. Uh, but after a while, I'm like, wait, this is exactly the same thing. And I fell in love with the same thing that I fell in love with, with cigars, right? Like all the different devices and flavors and, you know, it didn't taste bad and, and all of this. Um, so that's a very quick version of my story, but eventually it led me to the place uh, where I realized, you know, what I was doing with this, just, I, after I kind of got over the newness of all the flavors and everything, I'm like, this is the same thing. This is the same trap I fell right back into. Um, and so I used the This Naked Mind method. I really wish this book had been out when I did that, um, but that's okay. Uh, I, I used the same process to, to kind of get myself off of it. Um, and it was bumpy, you know, like it had been before. It took trial and error, but eventually I got to the spot where I was able to leave it behind me. And that's what I did. Oh, that's just so awesome. Thanks, Scott. What about you, William? So I, I started smoking, I think I was about 14. Um, and it was that sort of going out with friends and people would hand cigarettes around and you sort of try it just to see what would happen. Um, and I remember a lot of people saying, you know, when you first try a cigarette, you cough. Well, funnily enough, I never did. I first cigarette I had, I kind of fell in love with it. It made me kind of, I, I suppose I'd call it high, but it made me feel a bit kind of dizzy, a bit, you know, just made me feel different. And I kind of fell in love with it from the off. Um, but then for the first, I'm trying to remember how, how long, it must have been sort of about a year or so, I'd only ever smoke at weekends. And I was kind of comfortable with that. Like during the week, I just wouldn't smoke. And then the weekend would come along and I'd have a few cigarettes with friends. Um, and it went on like that for quite a long time. And it's almost, you know, when you're in those early stages, you're kind of thinking, oh, wow, I've beaten the system. You know, there's all these people who have to chain smoke all the time, but not me. <laughs> I've escaped. But then, of course, you know, it gradually, you know, it gradually creeps up because I was living at home with my parents. And obviously I didn't tell them I smoked. And then, you know, there'd be evenings when they'd go out during the week and I think, oh, I can have a cigarette. Um, and so that was fine. So I was smoking at weekends and then occasionally during the week, but if I couldn't smoke, it wasn't a problem, but then there'd be occasions where they were going to go out. So I was looking forward to a cigarette and then for whatever reason they wouldn't go. And then it was like, Oh, that was, that didn't feel so good. And then it kind of incrementally built up and up. Um, and then when I went to university and moved out, it just took over completely. So I was just smoking full time. Um, and that went on for a number of years. And I was trying to think the other day, I, I kind of, I went for quite, I'd stopped for quite extended periods, but I did a very similar thing to you in that it was just very easy to fall back into. Mm -hmm. um, and at one point, you know, I'd quit. I was fairly pleased with the fact I'd quit. I was living with an American, so I was living in a house share. And there was an American chap there and he introduced me to dip. So I kind of started dipping. And then, of course, that led me back to smoking again, like a similar thing. It's like when you're back on the nicotine, you just mm -hmm. you, you just fall back into it. Um, and so I rattled around for quite a few years with that sort of stopping and starting and eventually found something that kind of clicked for me as well, which is kind of an amalgamation of things. I read Alan Carr. So his quit smoking book, which I know you both know, Alan Carr. Yeah. Um, and it opened, it really opened my eyes. It was fast. I think it was about 16 when I read it. I found it so interesting and I believed every word of it, but somehow it didn't quite hit the spot for me. And so, although I read it and I'd quit for a bit, but I'd always go back to it. So it was kind of, it almost felt like I was, you know, in, in a, a marble, in a tin, sort of rattling around, waiting to find that one bit where their hole is so you can sort of fall out of it. Um, and it, 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 as I say, eventually I got there, but it was, it was a, it was a long kind of process of trial and error to get there. Uh, it's, it, and it's so interesting because, you know, alcohol, the last statistic that I saw, and this has been a few years ago now, and I haven't seen this updated and I'm sure, you know, with the pandemic, it probably has increased quite a bit, but the last statistic I saw was that in the U S alcohol accounts for 88,000 deaths per year. And, you know, nicotine is actually higher than that. And I don't know if this number is globally, but it was 480,000 deaths per year, mm. which that's US only, yeah. that's a US only. That's what I yeah, thought. Yeah. I was like, wanted to make sure we got our stats right. So, yeah. I mean, it's gosh, almost five times higher than alcohol related deaths. And like Scott, to your point with the introduction of vaping, it was almost as if we've had a, a cultural 
a little bit of a cultural brainwashing, whereas like you can have your cake and eat it too. Like, oh, don't worry. Like you still want to, you know, have this because one of the parts um, that you wrote in the book, William, that you talk about is you said that for you, when you first started smoking and when you really like got it, it was the difference between enjoying life and suffering through it. Like it, it just, and I'd love for you to expand on this. So it was like, you wanted to do this, but we all knew cigarettes were bad. And then vaping came in and it was kind of like, oh, oh, great. Both and right. But that's yeah, yeah. actually not really the case. No, no, no. It's so that that statistics amazing at 480,000 people a year. But I think one of the problems with those kind of statistics is like for me as a smoker, you know, those kind of statistics were available. You knew a lot of people were dying from smoking. But from my perspective, I almost looked at it like, yeah, but there's a lot of people dying of old age. You know, you you live and you die and it might be smoking that kills you or it might be a lot of other things. And I almost viewed it like, um, you know, smoking's not good for you and probably a lot of other things are. So, you know, there might be an evening where I decide to have a burger instead of a salad and that's probably going to have a detrimental effect on me. And there might be a day where I can't be bothered to go to the gym. So I just sit in front of the TV and that's probably going to have a detrimental effect on me. So, So that's kind of how I viewed it, almost like, you know, you make your lifestyle choices and they may have an impact on how long you're going to live for, but really am I bothered about what's going to happen in 30, 40 years time anyway? And I think one of the big turning points was for me was learning about the huge impact it had on my quality of life here and now, because I think that is something people miss. They just assume that smoking is almost like walking on a minefield you know you may step on something and get cancer or something and it kills you but if you don't you get away with it scot-free um excuse the it's (laughs) fine (laughs) Um, but no so so I mean that was the big thing for me it was starting to learn how nicotine affected me on a day-to-day basis here and now even when Mm -hmm. I was a teenager and had only just started it was having that massive effect and actually learning Mm -hmm. about the physiology and how it affects you physically and mentally started to make that huge leap. And that I think is one of the key things because, you know, I've read the most ridiculous things, including, you know, vaping's no worse than a cup of coffee. You know, you hear things like that, but of course it is. It absolutely is because the thing that's damaging you is the nicotine. And if you lift the nicotine out of the cigarette, yes, you don't get all the carbon monoxide and all the other chemicals that are also bad for you, but nicotine in and of itself is a poison. And not only that, it's one that destroys your quality of life here and now. Forget, you know, 30, 40 years down the line, whatever it is. And I I think that's the thing that we should just unpack so, so importantly, because the reality is, and, and one of the, the shared themes of our previous books is that this gloom and doom, you're going to die or so, you know, it, it actually doesn't change behavior. Like the fear-based comments, they don't mm. change behavior. They make mm. us feel much less comfortable with our behavior. So they do introduce a level of like cognitive dissonance or having two competing ideas in your mind at the same time, but they don't do a lot to change our behavior. And so when we're coming with these, you know, very intense packages that they have in some parts of the world on, on cigarettes or, you know, really fear-based things. Like there's some maybe incremental change of the people who actually weren't addicted anyway, who said, right, now that I see that I'm going to put it down. But on the whole, especially for people who have moved into that, no, this is, this is important for me. It doesn't actually change behavior. And, and I think for the purposes of our conversation, let's define uh, addiction as wanting to do less of something and being unable to. And I think that what you're talking about, William, and I'd love for you both to expand on this, is that in this instance, the day-to-day function of having to, and, and my, I smoked, but it was not, it was not nicotine, <laughs> but I do remember having this experience of like, okay, you know, it was legal in Colorado. I was leaving Colorado and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get on a plane. Right. And I know that's true for, for people who smoke and vape as well. Okay. I can't actually do this on the plane. So actually that plane ride, which should be fun because I'm going somewhere new 
becomes a huge stressor or that time when someone's visiting becomes a huge stressor or to your point when your parents are coming home when you thought they weren't going to be coming home becomes a huge stressor and it's not only that the times when you can't do it become stressors but actually it starts to overcome and creep into all of your thoughts because you start to run into this like you're you're not really present in the moments you're actually just thinking about the next time you're going to smoke or vape or dip. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that, that I think it well, might be a good time just to sort of touch on the physiology, physiology yeah. of yeah. nicotine because it is a stimulant. So it's quite a powerful stimulant. Um, and of course the problem is your brain works by way of homeostasis, which is a delicate chemical balance of, you know, more chemicals, drugs and hormones than we as humans have actually listed at the moment, still less do we understand how they all interplay with one another. But when you take a powerful stimulant like nicotine, your body reacts to it um, in such a way, it's easiest to sort of think of it as a, like a weighing scale. So you've got your depressants on one side, your sedatives on one side and your stimulants on the other. Now, if you put something extra on the stimulant side, your brain takes or puts more on the depressant side to try and balance it up. So essentially what you're doing is just interrupting that de delicate chemical balance. So when the nicotine wears off, you're left feeling out of sorts and unpleasant because your brain recalibrates so that it's working at its best when it's got nicotine there. So when the nicotine disappears, you feel worse. So when you then retake that nicotine, it does feel wonderful. It feels really nice, but only by removing a, you know, an unpleasant feeling that it caused previously. And I think that's, that's where it really comes into play. And I think that's what it came about before when I was, you know, when you quoted Annie about me saying that it was a difference between living life and just suffering it, because it would always feel like life was flat without smoking. Yeah. And what I started to realize was it wasn't nicotine that was putting the icing on the cake. Nicotine was taking the icing off the cake and then putting it back on again. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of, it's very hard for people to see this because when you're living it, all you know is you feel much better when you're having a cigarette and mm. nothing is quite the same without one, but it's just, it's that reverse thing, isn't it? You're coming around it completely the wrong way. That's so I have to say that idea of nicotine solving the problem it created in the first place was massively mind shifting for me, right? Because <clears throat> so many people look at it that way. They look at it like, oh, I'm going to go relax, right? It, it's actually very similar with alcohol, but like, I'm going to go relax. I'm going to go have a cigarette, right? Or have a vape or whatever. Um, and it, it feels so real when you're in it, in that mm -hmm. moment that like, ah, oh, there it is. But when you realize, when you can truly see that it's literally just fixing a problem it caused in the first place. And I'd be remiss if I didn't try to make a joke about government here. But like if when you see that that's what it's doing, you start to go, wait a minute, this whole thing is useless. So like all of the ups and downs, all of the, you know, what the hell am I going to do on a plane sort of stuff? All of that stuff is actually a problem created by nicotine, not created by a lack of nicotine. Mm. Exactly. And I think when, when you get to that point, you immediately, you kind of shift your perspective because then you start to realize actually it's not giving anything to me anyway. Mm -hmm. And then I think when you start to factor in the other things, it becomes even more apparent. One of the big shockers for me, um, I was ne like when I was smoking, I was never fit. You know, I just was incredibly unfit. I didn't necessarily tie it down to my smoking. I didn't do any exercise. I spent a lot of time sitting around playing computer games. So I would probably have chalked it up to that. But what I didn't realize at the time is nicotine being a stimulant speeds up your heart rate. Now, when your heart rate speeds up, your body starts saying to you, stop and sit down. It's just a natural reaction. This is why exercise is difficult. When you're pushing yourself and your heart rate goes up, your body starts saying, stop, calm down, because it wants your heart rate to drop. So when you're smoking, you can be sat down, but your heart rate goes up through the roof and it makes you feel very tired and lethargic. So it was actually the smoking. It's not only impacting your fitness, but that has a massive impact on just how you feel. 
because when you feel sort of strong and healthy you feel confident and happy it really has a massive impact and i think that was so that was another point for me that really started to drive it home because i began to realize even then you know as an 18 year old it started to dawn on me that you know what it may not have an impact as in i'm going to die of smoking anytime soon but it's impacting who i am here and now because I don't have that light, happy feeling that I should have because I've constantly got that elevated heart rate that nicotine causes. It's just mind blowing. I mean, it's so mind blowing when you start to crack open what's really going on and, and just sort of wonder like, oh, you know, and, and that's one of the things that I think is so great about being human is that when we can start to see these traps, when we can start to see this, it kind of unravels of its own weight, which is, is a really great thing. And I think the goal for this naked mind for nicotine is that you transition from one state of mind to another, like you change your perspective through the information that William, you are just so brilliant at articulating the science. That's one of the most powerful things about alcohol explained and nicotine explained and all of your previous works is you're just so brilliant at articulating the science is that you can change your perspective that quitting is no longer hard work which is the whole point. Right. And, and I, I just, I just love that. So speaking of quitting, you know, once the perspective shift has happened, not being as hard, I know you both have both quit both now. How would you, how would you evaluate alcohol versus nicotine? I think the big difference for me personally is I see alcohol probably sitting about 50 years behind smoking mm -hmm. in that People have realized smoking is not good for you. Um, it's, you know, f years ago, it used to be very sociable. You know, I remember I'm saying to my kids at the moment, they're nine and 11. And we, you know, we're talking, having conversations around cigarettes and they find it incomprehensible that yeah. we used to come around your house and smoke. You know, it was considered bad manners if you didn't have an ashtray for people. Um, people used to smoke on buses, on trains. I remember sitting in the cinema and people were smoking. That's all completely gone now people have a much more realistic view of smoking in that it's drug addiction it's incredibly bad for you it, it, there's nothing positive about it which is exactly the same for alcohol but society hasn't quite caught up with that yet so for me that's the biggest difficulty i think or the biggest difference between the two mm -hmm. when you quit smoking it's generally quite positive um and you don't so much come across those images kind of glorifying smoking but when you quit alcohol, you can be ostracized and you're certainly hit, bombarded by those constant images of laughing, happy drinkers, as if, you know, the reason they're laughing and happy is because of the alcohol. Which, of course, alcohol works the exact same way, even exacerbated, yeah. because mm -hmm. the, the function of alcohol actually creates stress hormones in the body. So it's even at a, a different level and fascinating. Mm -hmm. What about you, Scott? Which one was harder? For me nicotine was way harder. Um, and it was mainly, it wasn't painful. It wasn't, you know, like, just like with alcohol, like cravings aren't, they're, they're not painful. I just had a massive brain fog for a few days. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the thing that was difficult about it is I knew that, um, like you guys say in the book, you know, when you have, if it's been a while and you have a hit of nicotine, you don't necessarily get that, ah, feeling that we smokers become used to. Uh, but I did know that it might help me cut through the fog a little bit. And that was really difficult. Um, I love thinking and talking. That's a, that's a weird thing to say, but I do. And when that, when that is like hindered, I almost didn't feel like myself. Um, and so that was that I experienced that to an extent with alcohol, but to a much greater extent with nicotine. And I think some of that has to do with, uh, the fact that with vaping, like I was on a vaping schedule, like I could, you know, like, like I said before, like anytime, anywhere. So, um, I had just become so much more accustomed to, at least for me, drinking was in the evenings. It was certainly excessive, but there was like a time and a place. Whereas with smoking, there really wasn't a time and a place. It was just like, can I get away with it right now? And I had so many more opportunities. Um, I will also say though, that when that fog lifted, which it does kind of gradually, um, the clarity I got out of it was worth it. So even though for that, you know, it was about a, I would say probably three or four days where it was really bad, where I, I felt like 
I, I remember saying to my wife, I feel like I'm thinking in mud, just like, mm-hmm. you know, just yeah. like my brain's not moving. Um, man, on the other side of it, it felt so incredible. But yeah, for sure, hands down for me, nicotine was harder. Mm. So I, I want to ask um, this question, and Scott, I'll start with you, and then and then William, you can swing in with the the science and your own experience. But I assume you tried to cut back before just quitting. And totally. How did that go? Yeah. Well, it makes perfect sense, right? Like you just like kind of move backward. All also funny about this is I had already quit drinking, so like I kind of knew the answer to this, but. For me, it was a way I was like, well, maybe if I just let go gradually, it will be easier. Um, It didn't really do much other than kind of make me miserable on a more regular basis, Uh, you know, and and I found that like I couldn't stick with it. So I had spreadsheets. I had alarms set on my phone, right? I had all these tools that I was going to use. And just like with drinking, when I try to cut back on that, I felt fantastic when I made these plans. I felt great, right? Um, But then the reality in living those plans was it almost in a way made things harder because I was almost more focused on it. I I found myself like checking my watch or checking my phone all the time, be like, how much time do I have left? Um, And I didn't find a lot of peace from it at all. All I found was that I actually had more noise in my head. And after a couple of days, I would eventually get to the, F this point and just, you know, just go back to it. It, It's often the goal when people want to quit something is not to just quit. They want to cut down. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've already spoken just to delve into the science slightly here, but I've already spoken about how nicotine is a stimulant. So your brain recalibrates and then as it wears off, it creates this unpleasant feeling that needs another dose of nicotine to get away from it. And that is your basic take a drug, suffer a withdrawal and then take it again to get rid of that withdrawal. Mm -hmm. But that is just the chemical side of it. And the chemical side on its own doesn't cause the addiction because there's an additional element because when nicotine or alcohol or any addictive drug wears off, it leaves an unpleasant feeling. So we don't feel particularly good. But there's lots and lots of reasons in life why we might not feel good. You know, you might have an argument with a partner, you might have a bad day at work, the kids might be playing up, you might just, you know, sometimes you just wake up not feeling good and you don't know why it might be chemical, it might be the planets out of a line, we don't really know. Most of the time when we feel bad, we just get on with things, you know, we ignore it, we just carry on. But with repeated use, our brain in particular our subconscious learns a very valuable lesson what it learns is when this particular feeling kicks in there's a way we can get rid of it and that's to have another dose of the drug so in this situation i was talking about how you know i used to smoke at weekends and i was fine with that it's not that i wouldn't get the withdrawal i'd feel slightly out of sorts slightly woolly headed not particularly good but it just wouldn't dawn on me to take a cigarette to get rid of that feeling Mm -hmm. but with repeated use I start, my brain started to make that connection. So it would start to feel an unpleasant feeling and it would interpret that as I need a cigarette because to have another cigarette is how you get rid of that feeling. And that key for me, that's really the crux between an addiction and not being addicted to something. It's not the withdrawal, it's the brain interpreting that withdrawal as wanting another one. Because when you get there, no matter how many doses of a drug you take, when it starts to wear off, you want another one. Now that is learned behavior and what's learned cannot be unlearned. So when you cross that line with any drug, you can't go back. So everyone will sit there as a smoker or a vapor and think I'm smoking too much. I'm vaping too much. I'm dipping too much. But I remember when I started and I could just smoke, dip, vape at weekends. So I just need to get back to that stage. But what they don't factor in is they can't get back to that stage because they're no longer at that piece, that place, which is ultimately born of ignorance because that unpleasant feeling was there, but it just never dawned on them to take a cigarette or whatever it was to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a chemical psychological reason why it's very difficult to go back. There's another reason as well, because this is the difference between Um, the idea of something and the reality because so much in life the idea of it is very different to the reality and when we think about cutting back this is what we think of we think of what I described when I started so you know I have a couple of cigarettes at the weekend 
and then I put them away. I don't even think about them again until the following weekend or I have whatever you're, you know, I have one an hour or one a day or whatever it is. And what we think is you have that one, you enjoy it and then you forget about it until the next time. But that is not the reality of it. The reality of moderation or cutting down is desperately wanting something, having it, it goes far too quickly. And as soon as it's gone, you want it just as bad as you did before you had it. So it's it's not what you think it is. It's it's an actually, and you've just described it very well, it's a very unpleasant phase to be in. And you're more, in a way, obsessed with smoking or drinking or whatever it is when you're trying to moderate than when you could just have it as much as you wanted. So it just, it, for that, two reasons, it, it's just, it's not what people think it is. And it's a very, very difficult thing to, to actually achieve anyway. It felt like walking a tightrope. Mm. Right. It was like, I was constantly on balance. Con like I had to concentrate on it. It wasn't something that just naturally happened. No, no, that's the thing. It's not, you, you can never go back to that, take it or leave it phase because mm -hmm. when your brain makes that connection, you can never again have a, you, you're never again in control because every time that that drug wears off, you want another one. Yeah. I mean, that was my experience with alcohol as well is that when I started to try to cut back, the amount of space it took in my brain increased mm. by a lot yeah. as opposed to before I ever thought about cutting back. And so it's almost like that, that moment of cutting back or thinking about it is necessary because you have to come to reckoning with how sort of obsessed you are with the substance through that moment. But it is yeah, wildly unpleasant. And I think you just articulated it really, really well. I, I have a question about, you know, <laughs> I, I'm sure people listening to this, especially people who have stopped drinking. And, and I remember feeling the same way. It's like, oh, geez, well, I, I'm not drinking, you know, I'm like cutting back on all of these things. Like, come on, vaping, like, isn't there anything that I can do? Like, what, what, what's wrong with this? How, how you know, and I, I think what I'd love to have a discussion about is just coping mechanisms in general, because the reality is we're doing all of these things to just try to cope. And we do, we do switch one for another. And we hope that that one we're switching out is of less cost. And it is interesting with nicotine because, you know, you're not really um, driving your car. I don't even know what the word for drunk on nicotine is. Like there isn't even really one, right? Because the, the feeling really. actually passes so quickly within minutes, right? And then you, yeah. if, in, if you're in an hour, the at least alcohol lasts 20 minutes before you get into that withdrawal syndrome. I mean, I think nicotine's like three minutes or something like that. And then you're spending the whole rest of that time. If you're allowing yourself one cigarette an hour to be in that withdrawal syndrome, but, but we think, Oh, but we need something. We need something to cope. How have you both navigated that and not just replaced it with something else? So I, so for me, I, so, so I did it the opposite way to Scott did. I, I quit smoking first and then drinking. Um, and actually, I think one of the reasons my drinking ramped up is because I stopped smoking. Because, you know, you use drinking and smoking as kind of a crux, as a crutch of, you know, go-to coping mechanism. Um, and then you cut one out and you tend to go to the other. And for me, it was very much that I think whether you're drinking or smoking or both, you become very accustomed to consuming something to change how you feel so you have a bad day or you know something upsets you and you reach for a cigarette or a drink and it's teaching you to consume something so you, you cut one out and you start to rely more heavily on the other um and then you might want to cut that one out and a lot of people then start consuming loads of sugar but for mm -hmm. me it's all the same thing it's about i don't feel good what <laughs> what can i put in my mouth <laughs> consume to make me feel better and so for me it was getting away from that and actually consciously choosing some more positive coping mechanisms. And to a degree, I had a head start on that because I was in the military for a few years. Um, and obviously they put a lot of emphasis on physical fitness. And I remember like being woken up at some ridiculous hour and they take you out, and run you absolutely ragged. And at the time you'd be thinking, what, why am I doing this to myself? I hate it. And then you go and grab a shower, you're going for some breakfast. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know what? I feel really good. I just, I feel great for that. And, and so to a degree that was massively useful for me because when I cut out drinking and smoking, I just naturally, and, and not even consciously at the time, but I just started relying on exercise. Um, and for me, it was just 
it doesn't have to be exercise it just has to be anything but just something that try not to drift into it because it's very easy to drift into you know certainly there's things you can do that are less harmful but for me it comes down to are you living your best life is this a really good coping mechanism with minimal downside you know eating smoking and drinking the answer is going to be no um so for me exercise was the big one but i also discovered um you know things like reading or just hobbies anything that you're that taken up with that it takes your mind off the stresses and strains of everyday life is good because that is essentially what meditation mm -hmm. is it's just emptying your mind of things and you don't necessarily need to meditate to do that you can use you know like a, a really good book or you know whatever your hobbies might be so for me it was turning to sort of exercise reading those kind of things so supposedly without downside but yeah <laughs> i uh my main thing and it wasn't hard exercise at all i gave myself permission that when i started to feel like it was too much and i started to think about it my my rule was to put down whatever i was doing and go for a walk um so i guess technically exercise but it wasn't rigorous exercise at all i found that just movement helped um, and we know that there's a lot of correlation between movement and emotion and, you know, how we hold our bodies and, and all of that. Um, but for me, uh, and of course, there's certain times when you can't, like if I was feeling it right now, I couldn't get up and walk out while we're on Zoom together. But I had this, I had this thing where, hey, if I'm writing something, if I'm just at home, you know, with the kids and there's someone to watch them, whatever it is, when that overwhelm came, when that time came where I really felt it was getting strong, that's what I did to cope. And man, did that make a difference for me? Um, it really changed things for me. And guess what? Just like vaping, you can walk anywhere. Um, so I could do it if I was at my office. I could do it if I was at home. I, you know, I could do it anywhere. Um, and that, to this day, I still do that. Um, and it's something that was really, really helpful for me. I love that. Uh, I, I was told a frame a while ago, um, and I don't remember exactly where I heard this, but of just looking at all these things we do to cope through kind of three questions, which is it, does it feel good? And you can argue both sides of that coin with, with everything we're talking about, mm -hmm. the substance, but let's say, yes, that's a, that's a yes, because in the short term, it is making us feel better. So does it feel good as one? Is it good for you? And is it good for the others? you know, people you love, the planet, the whole, the collective, all those sorts of things. And if it, if it doesn't tick those boxes that it is, but because there are things that all three of those are true exercises, all three of those are true, right? Reading all three of those can be true. Um, and so it's really looking at the things that we're going to choose as coping mechanisms through that lens of does it actually feel good? And I would argue the feel good too, because the feel good is actually cumulatively worse uh, and I think that's one of the things that you articulate really well in the book, William, is how that downward trajectory, because it isn't as if it, you know, we said earlier, it's a, as if nicotine is putting the icing on the cake, but we don't realize that nicotine has just taken the icing off in the first place. But over the long term, in the bigger picture view, that isn't even true over, over the long term. Yeah, exactly. It's you know, a very basic mechanism, it's taking before it gives to you. So you're never actually gaining with it. But you know, I mentioned how it speeds your heart rate up and how that makes you feel tired and lethargic. That's actually accumulative. So not, not wanting to go into too much detail, but one of the big, you know, we talk a lot about fitness. And you know, when you feel fit, when you feel strong, you feel a lot more confident and happy mentally. One of the big um, physical characteristics of fitness is actually your blood composition. So, you know, when you exercise, your muscles move and they need oxygen. Now, the oxygen's brought to your muscles through the red blood cells in your blood. So when you exercise regularly, your heart's having to constantly speed up to supply your muscles with oxygen via the red blood cells. Um, when you do that regularly, there's two important changes that take place in your blood. One is that the red blood cells are taken out of circulation much earlier. And the reason that is important is because red blood cells can carry more oxygen. And the second big change is that um, the blood gets a greater concentration of red blood cells. 
So every time your heart beats, it contains more oxygen. So it can get more and more oxygen is getting to your muscles. So this is why resting heart rate is a big indicator of general health. The lower it is, the better. Um, so that's basically where we are with now, if you speed up your heart regularly by exercise, you become fitter. But if you speed up your heart without any associated physical activity, you're actually reversing the process because if you're sat still and your blood part is bumping at a certain level and your muscles are getting enough oxygen, and then you take a drug that accelerates your heart rate, your muscles are getting too much oxygen. So your blood reverses. So the red blood cells are left in circulation longer and the concentration diminishes. So not only does smoking make you feel heavy and lethargic in the short term, it actually erodes your fitness. That's why one of the massive killers with smoking is cardiovascular. Um, and, and this is one of the things And over time, of course, the more unfit you become, the more that impacts your mental health as well. Because as I said, when you're feeling fit and healthy and strong, you feel at your best mentally. Not to say you don't have bad days. Of course you do. Everybody does. But generally, you're, you're in a better place to begin with. Um, and, and, that, and that for me was one of the big things. So e even at a basic level, you're not gaining anything. But when you start to factor all this in over time, how you become, it just erodes you generally, you end up way, way worse than you are, even when you're smoking that cigarette than had you never had one in the first place. Oh, it's, it's, it's damning evidence. Let's just say that. Like, <laughs> it's just mind blowing. Um, so uh, I want to I want to finish up with the question I always ask at the end of this podcast, even though it might be a well, let's see if it let's see if it fits let's see if it works. But before we do, I want to say that this Naked Mind for Nicotine is is coming out soon. It is available for pre order anywhere you know books are sold. And a, a big ask of ours would be if you're interested in the book to support your local bookstores and order it through your local bookstores just to support small businesses and in your communities. But if you pre-order it, we will be sending out something where you will actually get a course for free on, on this. So a companion course to the book to just help it all stick better. And that will be free when the pre-order is happening. So all the details are included within this um, podcast show notes and in the links and all sorts of stuff like that. But should you be interested, we're really excited about this. I mean, this is I think for me, just a huge milestone into how this naked mind methodology, you know, both the science and the compassion and just the deconstruction of what's really happening in the brain can apply to so many more things than just alcohol. I think I'm just super excited. So anyway, let's end with this final question. Uh, William, I'm going to ask you first and Scott, I'm going to end with you. So if you are going to go back in time, and I think that that quote uh, from the book that you said is just so, so poignant. I mean, you said, quote, that for me, smoking was a difference between enjoying life and suffering through it. And you believed that so fully, so much so that like, it didn't matter that there was 480,000 deaths a year in America alone. It didn't matter that, you know, it's, we, we know consciously that it's a leading source of all sorts of diseases. None of that mattered because this belief was so true. And you were going to go back in time and talk to William. What would you say to him about what you've discovered and how life is now? I think I would be saying pretty much what I've just said. I think the thing I didn't appreciate was how much it was impacting me there and then I saw it as it's very pleasurable it may affect me 20 30 40 50 years down the line but who cares about that you know especially when you're a teenager you just don't care um, and that's what I think I would emphasize that that isn't the case at all even at you know at that age where the physical effects are probably at their absolute lowest it was still having a massive detrimental effect on just not only how I lived my life, but just me as a person as well, because I was feeling heavier. I wasn't, you know, I used to be quite fit and do sports at school. And that just completely tailed off as soon as I discovered smoking. Yeah, I love that. So Scott, throwing the same question to you, what would you tell Scott who was sneaking off at all sorts of times and feeling stuck? I would say, you know, one of the main reasons that I used nicotine was to deal with stress. And it's just that idea that you like, Hey buddy, you think you're getting rid of stress with this, but you're actually adding stress with it. 
um, just that concept alone was mind blowing enough for me. And, you know, what I can deal with, what I can handle now is way bigger than it ever was with nicotine. Um, and that's simply because I would get stressed out. I would reach for some nicotine and I'd be like, ah, great. Now I can work. I wasn't allowing myself to grow, right? I wasn't like pushing those boundaries. Now, now I don't have that. Yes, I still go for walks from time to time. But when that stress comes up, it's a completely different experience. And I'm able to push through and break through on my own merits, not with something that I thought was helping me. That's something I really wish I knew. Wow, that's awesome. That's so good. Well, I am just so excited for this because I I do feel like it's a very natural transition for us to say, okay, well, at least I put down the bottle. I'm not driving drunk anymore. I'm not ignoring my kids. I'm not, you know, all of these sorts of things. And while admittedly nicotine doesn't have those same sort of tragic effects as we see on society with alcohol, it does have very tragic internal effects of just robbing us of our joy in the moment, in the days and, and tricking us really into thinking that it's doing something positive for us when the outcome is wholly negative. So I'm, I'm so excited for people to have sort of the scales lifted from our collective eyes around this conversation as well, especially now that it's become so insidious with vaping and with kids and, you know, just the whole, the whole idea that, oh, well, if it's in a vape pen, then there is no harm. There is no damage, but everything we said today applies. You know, we noticed we didn't even talk about the toxins in the smoke or any of that stuff, because that's, that's not really the cost. You know, the cost is to your emotional health. And, and that's on a very specific daily basis is just not feeling good enough and for sure not feeling as good as you can. So thank you guys both so much for coming on. I'm, I'm really excited about this launch. And again, order, pre-order the book, This Naked Mind for Nicotine, anywhere books are sold and support your local bookstores. Here's a question I get asked often. Annie, do you think your science-backed, grace-led approach to alcohol could work for other things like nicotine? People have asked me this question for years, and the answer is a resounding yes. And finally, there's a book for that. William Porter, the author of Alcohol Explained, and I have joined forces to bring you This Naked Mind Nicotine. We've combined our proven habit-breaking systems that help thousands overcome alcohol without willpower, without pain, without missing out, to help people quit smoking and vaping the same way without the pain. So start your no nicotine journey today by pre-ordering This Naked Mind Nicotine at thisnakedmindnicotine.com. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.